All right, let's pray before we sing together. Lord, just receive our praises today. Fill us with your peace, with your joy. Help us to be able to really connect with you, to lift our hearts up to you in, in praise. And again, I just pray over the um, message today. Just pray over this service today. Um, pray that you're with people that aren't able to make it today, Lord. Um, we just lift them up to you. And we just thank you for, for being with us, Lord, and for sending your son for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's worship God together today. us to bring your son, cast off the power of hell, release us from that which holds us down and binds us. We lift you up for your goodness, Father.
from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. So my life you have been. introduce a new song today um, that Pastor Larry had brought up, and it's a really good song for reflecting back on our moments that we just shared with Easter um, and putting ourselves and uh, looking at Jesus' decision to go through and, be, and submit to the Father's will and how we in our own lives can have that attitude um, of letting go of what our will would be and, and embracing the Father's. That's what these words are. So I, it's a I hope that you're able to join in, um, but if not, just uh, pay attention to the words and let those kind of sink in today.
time of worship this morning, huh? Amen. I'm going to have you turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 16 this morning as we continue to uh, move forward in uh, part two of our series in the book of Proverbs. It got me kind of thinking, uh, there's a lot of worldly wisdom out there these days. Um, you got things like a balanced diet is... A cookie in both hands, right? Um, a dog can kill a skunk, it's just sometimes not worth it. <laughs> or a clear conscience is usually the sign of a bad memory. And uh, one of my favorites I probably need to take heed of more often is a closed mouth gathers no feet. <laughs> or what about this one? Age is a very high price to pay for maturity. Ben Franklin, he, he actually, he once wrote, Blessed is he that expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. <laughs> and then, of course, one of my all-time favorites, if you eat a live toad first thing in the morning, absolutely nothing worse can happen to you for the rest of the day. It's a good one. Truer words have never been spoken, right? Some years ago, there was a young man, he um, approached the foreman of a logging crew, and he was asking for a job, and the foreman says, well, that depends. You know, let's, uh, let's see you fell this tree. And uh, so the young man stepped up to the tree. He skillfully felled a great big tree, and impressed by this, the foreman said, all right, start Monday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday rolled by. And then Thursday afternoon, the foreman approached the young man, and he said, you can pick up your check in the office on your way out today. And surprised by that, the young man said, well, I thought you paid on Fridays. Well, normally we do, said the foreman, but uh, we're going to have to let you go today because you've, you've really fallen behind. You went from first place on Monday all the way to last place on Wednesday. And the young man, fighting for his job, very passionate, he wanted to keep his job, he said, but I'm a hard worker. You know, I, I, I arrive first, I leave last, I even work through my, my breaks. And the foreman, you know, seeing the boy's heart and integrity, he thought for a minute, and then he asked him, he says, have you been sharpening your axe? <laughs> to which the young man replied, no, I've been too busy and working too hard to take the time. Sometimes we get so busy that we forget to sharpen our axe. We forget to ask God for wisdom and guidance. We forget to ask him for his will his direction in our lives. We charge ahead trying to chop down all these trees in life with a dull blade. Using God's wisdom in life is like sharpening your blade. In Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, it actually warns us, before we get into Proverbs here, This I want to share this with you. It says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We need to sharpen our axe. Which brings us to Proverbs 16 and 16, which says this, How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. You know... The book of Proverbs gives us a lot of different comparisons. You, you start to read it, you'll start to realize, you'll see one comparison after another, and they point us in the right direction in life. And, and what you'll notice is that we'll be kind of reading some scriptures that are like 
the, the better than scriptures. This is better than this, or you know, because this, and it's better over here, and to be like this is better than to be like that. These are the, the better than statements that really will challenge and even sometimes, oftentimes, go against the wisdom of the world. Um, and this is where our trust in God, as I said last week, this is where our trust in the Lord comes into play. When the world's wisdom goes against God's wisdom, whose will you trust? Which one will you follow? Uh, will you trust God? Will you trust the world? Or maybe it's yourself. Maybe you're thinking that you have it all figured out, and so you're going to trust your own wisdom. Which one will you trust today? You know, there, there's so many better than kind of comparisons. We're only going to be able to get to a few of them today. But I want to start with this one right here, Proverbs 16, 18 to 19, because I believe that this godly wisdom kind of hits at the heart of maybe what can keep us from allowing God's wisdom to actually change us. So I want to tackle this first before we get really into all the better than statements. It says, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. You see, this is one of those quotes from the Bible that has kind of been reduced in our world you, you hear it often, people will say, pride goeth before the fall. You hear that often, you know, and we get the picture of the guy that's maybe walking around, his chest is all puffed out, you know, he thinks he's somebody, and then next thing you know, he's tripping over a rock right in front of him, just a moment later, you know. Or it's the little child that, you know, is very pleased with herself and then walks into a wall or the pole or the door and doesn't see that, you know, the little kid that's all proud and running, not even looking, and then boom, slams into the coffee table. We kind of get this, this picture. We get so focused on ourselves that we don't pay attention to the obstacles in front of us. And so, listen, I, we could. We could spend a lot of time on just the topic of pride, but I'm not going to do that today. But I, do, I, I do want to say this. I want to say this. Pride is the obstacle that is actually larger than the rock or the pole or, you know, the door that's in front of you. Pride is really the issue. It's not necessarily the rock or the, the post in front of you that that causes you to stumble. It's the pride. Pride comes before running into that pole. Pride comes before tripping over the rock. It will, I, pride will strip you of the joy from a lot of life's experiences. Um, I mean, just the activity or maybe a sport that you, that you love, that you do for fun, as you get better at that sport, guess what happens? Pride comes in. And starts to strip the pleasure that you get from that sport that you were doing for fun originally. Listen, this, this happens even with things as good and right as reading God's word. You say, how could that be? Because after a while, you, you become knowledgeable about the Bible. And other people value your knowledge even. And so you kind of start to enjoy that. And before you know it, you enjoy the appreciation of others for your knowledge more than the pleasure of learning God's word and getting to know Christ. It's something to guard against. Oh, you don't know the books of the Bible? Oh, I pray an hour a day. I mean, I, I can't understand how a Christian could sin like that. I just, I just think of myself as a humble servant. Pride even hinders... Pride even hinders our achievements. It makes us lose perspective on the things that really matter in life. Uh, I mean, it, it, it puts us at odds with other people, and, and we become less caring towards others, and even sometimes your own, your own spouse. Because when pride enters the picture, now it's, it's not about, in, in, in a marriage, no longer is it about learning and growing together as Christ would have you to, to become like Christ, because that's really the, the goal of marriage, believe it or not. It's not to find someone that loves you, it's to learn how to love someone and for the both of you to grow to become like Christ together, to help each other do that. That's the goal in marriage. And when pride gets in the picture, you know what it becomes? I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm going to prove it. And so then the, the, the debates ensue, right? Who's right and who's wrong? Pride goes before destruction because it quite literally sets us up for the destruction of those things that really, truly are valuable, like your marriage relationship, relationships with others, those things, those pleasures that you enjoy in life. 
pride goes before that destruction, it's because of the pride. It destroys those things. Now, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about wholesome pride. Not the kind of pride where the, you know, the, the child feels after they please their parents. Uh, or the athlete feels when they, they win a race or they win a game because they've strained for it and they trained for it. it. It's good to have values. It's good to have these things in the right place. The child loves his parents and desires to please them. Nothing wrong with that. The athlete sets goals and he pushes themselves and, and to do their best. And then so there's joy in the performance, especially when the performance results are, are good ones and they meet some of those goals they set. You see, where it goes wrong is when the child begins to demand, <laughs> demand praise from the parents. It goes wrong when the athlete sees winning as the only valuable goal in their life or in that sport. And they begin to believe that they're above others, which is an attitude that's very easy to fall into today. Because it's celebrated, isn't it? It really is celebrated in our society. We need to be careful because we can be prideful even about our own humility. You can be prideful about. I'm telling you, pride can get into everything. It can get into everything. So much so that we aren't even aware of it when it happens, which is... I think maybe why we, it's a warning in scripture. It's why we should examine our hearts before the Lord. So take a look at this in Romans 12 and 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And then it's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 that says, Likewise, ye younger... Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with pride. <laughs> Humility, right? Humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So let's take a look. It brings us to our first statement. Proverbs 12 and 9, which says this. He that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. I want you to think about that. What is the picture being painted here? This is a picture of comparison between someone with a, uh, what would be considered a very modest social status and then someone who's living beyond his means. That's the comparison. It's better to be unknown and yet self-supporting and even able to hire someone to help take your workload off of you than it is to actually boast that you are someone special, boast that you are somebody, and yet you're not even able to make ends meet. You're not even able to put food on the table. What good is it to actually claim such high and mighty things about yourself if you can't even put food on the table for your, yourself or for your family? So which is better? <laughs> Which is better? Take a look at this one. We're going to kind of go through these quickly because there's a bunch of them, okay? Proverbs chapter 15, 16 to 17. It goes against worldly wisdom for sure. It says, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. What's that? Well, usually you would choose wealth over poverty, right? I mean... Isn't that kind of the answer to all of our problems? When we don't have this or we don't have that, all we need is a little bit more money. And that'll take care of all of it, right? But here's the crazy thing. <clears throat> what, <clears throat> I guess the question really is, so we would normally choose wealth over poverty, but at what price? At what price? Would you rather have little but fear the Lord or wealth and trouble with it. And that word for trouble means turmoil. It means confusion. I mean, if a person has very little, but they have the fear of the Lord, that combination, he says, it's better than wealth, even, especially, if that wealth brings with it trouble. It's better. It's better. And then verse 17 basically says that it's better to have some vegetables in an atmosphere of love 
than it is to have a nice big juicy steak where there's hatred and tension. You guys ever gone out to dinner with, with uh, you know, family or, you know, and, and maybe something happened, something took place, and, and now you've got to sit down and have the meal, and there's the big elephant in the room, and there's the tension at the dinner table. You ever have those moments? Doesn't that just make all that food just taste awful? <laughs> I mean, it's just not the same anymore. It takes the joy. It takes the joy right out of the meal, you know? And uh, because love, the reason is love makes even our lesser circumstances in life something that can be endured, something that can be enjoyed even. It's hatred that takes away the joy that even a good juicy steak might bring you. The question again is, are you going to trust God in that? Are you going to trust God that it's better, that his way is better? Are you going to trust him in that? Take a look at this next one. Proverbs 16, verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. To say, okay, what does this really mean? What is the without right? This is another scripture that really teaches us what is better than wealth. Righteous living, even if it means having little, Righteous living with little gain is always better than gaining wealth dishonestly. Dishonest gain. Why? Because dishonest gain, my friends, eventually, guess what's going to happen? Eventually, you'll get what's coming to you. And I'm not talking about karma. I'm talking about God doesn't let sin go unpunished. He doesn't let his children continue to live their lives without being corrected. Why? Because he loves us. And so we need to know that it's always better. Little is better with righteousness than great revenues without right, with, without dishonest gain there. Take a look at what it says in Isaiah 32 and 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. How many of you guys ever just some days go, man, I just like a little peace and quiet. Anybody ever feel like that? I just need a little peace and quiet. Well, what does it say? The work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. You know what righteousness is? It's being in right standing. Being in right standing with God and man and you'll have some peace and quiet. You'll have peace and quiet. Take a look at this next one, Proverbs 16 and 19. Better is it to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So once again, we see how pride can be our downfall here. Well, one commentary, I, I like this, one commentary said this, was that basically that pride is, it is so bad that a person should avoid it even if it means living in the category of the economically oppressed. And we think, oh my goodness, we would never want to be one of those individuals in, in that category. Because, listen, here's the thing. The person who shares in the spoils of the proud, though, isn't going to like the fact that, once again, their dishonest gain will not go unpunished. It won't go unpunished. Somehow, some way, God will take care of it. Even if our authorities and law, the law doesn't take care of it. You ever get frustrated when people continue to get away with, with dishonesty and the, the, in our government and these people get away. It seems like they get away with murder, don't they? I mean, eventually, for me personally, I just sit back and I go, God, what gives? I mean, eventually, are they ever going to be held accountable? Hmm. Proverbs fifteen twenty five: The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Trust me. God will take care of it. One way or the other, God will take care of it. You know, in our society, the problem I think that we have is that pride is celebrated. I don't know if you've ever caught on or felt like this, but pride is celebrated. And what they do is they, they mask it. It masks array, masquerades around as self-confidence. You ever notice that? Pride. Oh, they're just, they're just very confident. That's pride. <laughs> it's pride. And you know the difference? You know how you can actually tell if it's pride or, or self-confidence? Because pride is the one 
that always steps all over humility and doesn't care. That's the difference. You can see it. But I tell you, don't worry about it. Listen to this in 1 Peter 5 and 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Not only will he take care of the prideful, but he's also going to take care of those who humble themselves under God. Now, I really like this next one. Proverbs 16, 32. I like this one. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Wow. Having patience, being able to control yourself, your own emotions, your spirit, right? Having that kind of patience and controlling your temper, that is actually honored by God above being even a great warrior. That's amazing to me. I want you to think about that. You see, in a time back then when strength, when uh, skill with the sword, when warfare, when that was really, this, this was how you, you took care of yourself. This is how you protected yourself and your family and your land. Um, safety was basically dependent upon, again, strength and skill and warfare. This proverb kind of sounds surprising, doesn't it? And yet in God's eyes, the ability to be self-controlled is actually more valuable than the ability to defeat a city. Hmm. Now, I know that that doesn't sound real deep and theological, but I think this is one of those things, not being able to control our emotions. I think that's one of those things that most people deal with, um, maybe on a daily basis. I mean, I, do we want to all talk about our drive to work in the morning? When your spouse does something and makes you upset, how do you react to that? What are some of the things that you say? Is it about getting back at them or is it about, is it about reconciling? What about other relationships when somebody does something? Are you able to control your emotions? Or do you just automatically just fly off the handle? I mean, really, when you think about it, this is something with your children when they upset you or at work, you're dealing with some things at work and somebody hurts your feelings. I mean, guys, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit, that's your emotions, that's who you are, man, better than he that take of a city? Hmm. Look at Proverbs 17, 21. Here's another one. This one here says, let a bear robbed of her whelps, those are her cubs, meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. How many hunters do we have in the room? Any of you guys ever want to come between the mama bear and her cubs? Ever? No. Not unless you have a big gun. <laughs> it's, it's not a good thing. You know, we've all heard the term mama bear when, when uh, referring to a mom protecting her children. The last thing you want to do is come between a mother bear and her cubs, right? No, actually, he says, the last thing you want to do is deal with a fool in his folly who's out of control. A fool who's out of, You ever been around an individual that's out of control? Think about it. What do you do if you're in between a mother bear and the cubs? If you see a mother bear approaching you, what, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to play dead? No, actually, you're supposed to make yourself feel real big and large, and you kind of back away slowly, stand your ground, but... Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, um, it's a slow retreat, but you, you try to make yourself look threatening, right? Well, the deal with the man in his folly is he's out of control, so that doesn't work. So you know what they do with a guy in his folly, a fool in his folly? You run the other direction. You just get away. You don't need to be there. You don't need to deal with it. Just find a way to get out of there. That's what you're supposed to do. The last thing you want to do is be around a man or a woman who is a fool in their folly. I want you to think about some examples in, in Scripture. Think about King Herod for a second. You guys remember King Herod? When the wise men didn't report back to him in regards to the newborn king of the Jews, Jesus, what did he do? He went out of control, didn't he? You remember what he did? He ordered the deaths of every boy child younger than two years old born in Bethlehem. And then you have 
somebody like King Nebuchadnezzar, who heated the furnace up seven times hotter than normal, refusing to bow down to God, and he throws Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into that furnace. I mean, think about it. It's a little, it's a little extreme, don't you think? And then you have King Saul, who killed 85 priests because they unknowingly helped young David. Imagine the danger. You've seen it on the news of coming across a fool with a weapon or a gun or a knife or even behind uh, the, the wheel of his car, um, driving down the road, drinking alcohol, and now they're on the road. They're basically, as my father-in-law would have called them, who, who worked for the fire department in Pontiac, he said, they're basically like a heat-seeking missile. Just somebody behind the wheel, and they're just flying, plowing down the road, and they'll mow down anybody in front of them. It doesn't even matter. It's a fool in their folly. Hmm. Take a look at uh, Proverbs 19 and 1. Here's another one. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that, per, than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Well, now we've got a combo here. Not only is he a fool, but he also has perverse lips. So here we have a comparison between someone with good character and then a fool with perverse speech. Better to be poor and have integrity? Absolutely. Now, the word for poor here, I want to make sure we kind of understand. This doesn't, well, I'll, I'll tell you what it does mean and then what it doesn't mean. The word for poor simply means destitute. It means hungry. They need something to eat. This is not a term that means that a person is poor because they're lazy. That's not the word poor here. And to walk in integrity means to be, it means to be morally whole. It means to be morally blameless. Now, to be a fool here, this means to be dull. It means to be thick-headed. <laughs> Anybody want to admit to being thick-headed? I know sometimes I am. <laughs> sometimes I can be thick-headed. Strong-headed, thick-headed, uh, that could be me sometimes for sure. But on the top of that, to be a fool with perverse, twisted speech. Twisted speech. Now, that's not a good combination at all, is it? Not at all. So you're telling me that a fool might try to get rich by dishonest ways, but honesty is always the better way, even if it means going hungry? Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's better to keep your integrity intact, even if it leads to poverty, than it is to actually compromise your convictions, the convictions that God gave you, even if your compromising were to lead you into great riches, don't compromise. Have integrity. Be hungry and have integrity. Guess what will happen? God will provide your next meal. Have integrity. You see, a lot of people think that if a person is poor, well, it must be because, you know, they have sin in their life. You know, they must have a lack of faith in God if they're poor. You know, the Jews used to think that way. The Jewish people in Jesus' day, that's what they thought. Any bad thing that happened to, to someone, it was, must have been a result of their sin. And Jesus had to reprimand them more than once. But I want to remind you of something else Jesus said to a couple of different churches in Revelation. One to the church in Smyrna compared to the church of Laodicea. Look at Revelation 2 and 9 where Jesus says this. He said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. These are the, these are the ones who weren't poor, but he's saying, actually, you're the rich ones. And then I want you to compare this. Look at the church of Laodicea. Take a look at this one. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, oh, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Oh, you have all the riches, do you? But actually, this is, this is where you're at. Hmm. Being a person of integrity is more important. It's more important than whether you're rich or poor. Now, can you be rich and have integrity? Absolutely. 
Absolutely, nothing wrong with that. And, it, and there are plenty of individuals out there that, that are wealthy and they have integrity. And I would say there's nothing wrong with striving for that. Take a look at this one. How about Proverbs 19 and 22? The desire of a man is his kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. Huh. So this is basically saying that the fruits of being kind are desirable. How many of you guys like being around an ornery person? I mean, you like being around someone who's kind. <laughs> kind of simple, isn't it? Right? Basically saying the fruits of being someone that's kind is desirable. Absolutely. Kindness is actually one of those traits that people find desirable and attractive in others. Um, listen, if you want to be attractive, guys, gals, singles, uh, if you're trying to look for that person out there that, you know, your significant other in the future, um, Try this. Try being like Jesus, who was the, in the image of kindness. Try being kind. Try being kind. See, I think, again, the problem is that our culture puts too much focus on outward appearance. It's always about how we look. We should be like the Lord Jesus who looks at the inward appearance, and, and we really should be putting that kindness out there. Take a look at Proverbs 21, or I'm sorry, 22, verse 1. Here's another one. Talks about the value of having a good name. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. You know, when Solomon said that a good name is more important than wealth, um, I think he knew what he was talking about, don't you? Remember who Solomon is, right? I mean, nobody has ever been as wealthy as Solomon. And he's saying, he's saying that he's saying that it's better to have a good name. He knew something about having a good name. He knew something about a good reputation, that it's better, it's greater than having wealth. Because, well, the honest truth is that wealth is useless if while you're gaining it, you're ruining your character. What's the good of, your, what's the good of all that wealth? You just get to enjoy it for a little while on this earth temporarily by yourself because nobody wants to be around you. And then when you die, you leave it behind for everybody else to enjoy. What good is that wealth? if you have ruined your character in the process. There's a story about Alexander the Great. Um, he was, uh, one day he was checking in on all of his soldiers, and he went to one of his troops he came across, and one of the soldiers, he was, he was kind of slouched over, you know, kind of looking down, and Alexander went up to him, and he asked him, he said, um, he said basically, he said, what, what's the problem? And the soldier said, well, I, you know, I'd been out the night before. I'd been out on the town, um, kind of up to no good. Alexander said, well, what's your name? And the soldier responded, my name is Alexander. <laughs> to which Alexander the Great then responded with, either change your conduct or change your name. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, my mom and dad were strict. They raised us in the church. They raised us to honor God and fear God in a healthy way and a healthy respect for God and his word. And, you know, there were times when my mom would have to discipline my brother and I. And I know my brother will he'll remember this, what mom used to say to us sometimes. She would be reprimanding us and disciplining us, and she would look right in our eyes. I mean, you know how some moms, they can look at you and it's like, uh, it's not daggers. I mean, they are like searching your soul. And she would look right into our eyes and she would say this. She would say, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then act like it. And I would go, oh, my goodness, man. I mean, just, the, just that truth alone. Why? Because we have a good name. As Christians, right? We have a good name. That's a good name to uphold. Because we follow the Lord Jesus. And it's one of the most important responsibilities, I believe, one of the greatest privileges that a person could have on planet Earth is to be one of his followers, to be one of his ambassadors, to, to be one of God's children. 
who we are in Christ Jesus is far more important. Your reputation as a Christ follower is far more important than great riches. And I want to end with this last one in Proverbs 28 and 6, which says this. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Here's another one. Basically, it's better to be poor and upright than rich and perverse, right? You, you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the story that Jesus told about the rich man and the poor man and Lazarus, uh, named Lazarus. You, you remember this. Jesus said, he said that this rich man, would, he would wear all these expensive clothes, and man, he was just decked out. He, he looked really good, and he would eat, you know, the expensive meals even, uh, while Lazarus, well, Lazarus would beg for crumbs. But here's the thing. The important difference between these two men was not really their wealth and their material possessions. It wasn't really about that at all. It was their spiritual condition. You see, the rich man was evil. The Bible says he was evil. Lazarus, he was righteous before God. He was in right standing before God. And when the rich man died, he goes to the place of the dead. But when Lazarus died, he goes to paradise. And Jesus says the evil rich man, he looked across that that great chasm, that great space that separated him from, you know, from, from Lazarus. And, and he told Lazarus, he cried out to Lazarus and said, could you just, could you just dip your finger in, in the water and, and touch my tongue to cool my tongue off because I'm being tormented in the flame. But Lazarus wasn't allowed to cross the space between them. Who was better off? The rich man who lived it up and was evil? Or Lazarus who begged for crumbs on this earth and yet now he's living, living it up at the king's table? Which is better? My friends, who's better off? Those who gain wisdom or those who gain wealth? Who's better off? Those who are prideful or those who are humble? Those who trust themselves and the wisdom of the world or those who trust God enough to ask him for his wisdom and live by it. Because I'll tell you this morning, when we allow God's word and wisdom to shape our thinking, when we allow God's word and his wisdom to guide our decisions, that's when we actually realize that his way is always better than our way. Who will you trust? Who's better off? Why don't you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, today we we just want to come to you this morning. We thank you, as always, for our time together as we've gathered in your name. Father, we thank you for your wisdom that you have given us in your word. Lord, it's my prayer that each and every one of us here is, will be able to just take something from your word today and really, truly, not just hear it, but apply it to use it in our lives. But Father, most importantly, the question, who's better off? The one who has gain the whole world and yet loses their soul or the one who doesn't even want to call this place home because they've put their faith, hope, and trust in your son Jesus and one day they'll be in heaven with you for eternity. Which is better? head bowed and eyes closed this morning if you're here today and maybe you need to answer that question is your life really better off today without Jesus in it I can tell you that there are so many people here that would agree with me when I say that there is no life better no matter how difficult life is, 
There's no life that is better than the life that is with Jesus that's surrendered to him. And if you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor Larry? I, I, I can sense God's talking to me right now. And I need to put my trust and I just need to surrender my life to Jesus. And I want to do that today. If you're here and you want to do that, listen, I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come forward. But if you're here and you say, I want to surrender to Jesus today, I do want to lead you in a prayer. And if that's where you're at today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would, just, just real quick, all you have to do is put your hand up and put it right back down. Just say, Pastor Larry, will you pray for me today? I want to surrender to Jesus. How many would raise their hands today? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? All right, I want you to say this prayer with me. If you've raised your hand this morning, just talk to God and just mean it from your heart. Just simply tell him. Just say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you. I'm not living my life the way that you want me to live today. And I just want to say that I'm I'm sorry. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sins because I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. So please forgive me today. Come into my heart and life. I surrender my life to you right now. I turn my, away from my old life. I repent of that. And I'm, I'm turning to you today in surrender, full surrender. I give it all to you. Give me your Holy Spirit so that I can follow you and your teachings and your word and help me to be a person of integrity. Regardless of my circumstances, I want to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with us today as we sing this last song, preparing our hearts for communion today. And if you feel like you need to do business with God, I encourage you to come forward and just pray and um, let's just worship God. This cornerstone, this side.